everyone, and welcome to the second annual RISE Travel Institute Student Conference. My name is Jody, and I am the Experiential Journey Committee Lead, and I'm also the Interim Lead of the Events Committee. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here today, but before we get started with the program, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. First, we're recording this event for those who cannot be here. Um, please keep yourself on mute throughout the event to minimize, minimize background noise. Um, and for those of you with us here on Zoom, there is a live transcript available um, if you click the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. There will be time for questions at the end of each student presentation, so um, hold them until then. Um, and now on for the show. Um, so for those that don't know, RISE is dedicated to traveler education. We believe in travel as a powerful force for positive transformation for both RISE traveler, um, for both the traveler and the travel destination. Our flagship program is a 10 week online course that explores different aspects of sustainable travel through structured, rigorous research-based education. We take a systems thinking approach to address the intersection of social justice, community development, animal protection, and environmental sustainability with regards to travel. Students that su successfully complete the program and a capstone project receive a certificate in sustainability and anti-oppression in travel, and graduates can apply to join one of our domestic or international experiential journeys, or EJs, um, to put theory into practice. We also have a number of short courses available about specific destinations and sustainable topics, as well as a course designed for educators. So I encourage everyone to take a look at our website. Today's wonderful presenters are graduates of our flagship program and have earned their certificates in sustainability and anti-oppression and travel. Before we would begin our presentations, I'm gonna pass the mic, so to speak, to um, RISE founder and a good friend, Vinci Ho. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon and good evening as well. Thank you for being here and, uh, and thank you for those who call in from around the world, especially those who get up early and those who are staying up at, you know, late at night to join us today. Thank you, Amanda um, and Selena. Welcome to the RISE Travel Institute second student conference. Before I even start my speech, um, I just would like to thank our event partner, the uh, Travel and Tourism Research Collaboratory of New York University's Teach Center uh, for Hospitality for their support, making our first ever hybrid event possible. So for those of you who are attending a RISE Travel Institute event for the first time, my name is Vincy Ho and I'm the founder and executive director of RISE. RISE Travel Institute, as Jody just said, is a 501c3 nonprofit um, we, with a mission to inspire responsible, impactful, sustainable, and ethical travel through education. And today we're going to have 12 amazing RISE alumni and graduating students from the two previous cohorts um, of our flagship certificate program presenting on a variety of topics surrounding sustainability, justice, inclusivity, and ethics in travel and tourism. And I'm really looking forward to these important conversations and I believe that you're as excited as I am. But before we dive more into the student conference and what it is all about, which my colleague Natalie is going to explain more later, let me first share what um, or who RISE Travel Institute is and what we do exactly. So we were founded in June 2020, not only in the midst of the pandemic, but also at the height of the Black Lives Matter movement in the US, sparked by the murder of George Floyd. So inspired by these two events, which basically defined what RISE was going to do or be like. Um, so I started to put together a curriculum on sustainable travel education. And I thought we can't really, you know, say that we're doing sustainability work without actually doing um, any justice like anti oppression work, simply because a society or an ecosystem or the planet can never be truly sustainable if systems or, you know, if the system or systems continue to perpetuate cycles of oppression that disproportionately favor some and harm others. So um, let's say our, for example, our conversation on sustainability um, has been very much focused on, you know, the environmental aspects, numbers, statistics, and um, carbon emissions. And while that is all very important, oftentimes we don't hear enough, you know, um, our stories of vulnerable communities around the world, especially in coastal regions, um, 
how they have been impacted disproportionately by climate change and how our choices and actions are related to these people who are so far away from us and their relationship to their lands and their wisdom on how to regenerate the planet. Um, so, so these are the things that we can all learn from and we decided that anti-oppression should be the lens we use across our curriculum, which is felt like a fairly unique approach in the space of tourism education. And if you look at the, um, our online education programs and courses, you see efforts in centering local communities and residents in all of our conversations, highlighting the interconnectedness of all social, animal, environmental justice issues at and beyond destinations and providing the knowledge and the tools and opportunities to have deep conversations um, and uncomfortable conversations and reflections about how to decolonize our mindsets as travelers and how to disrupt the status quo that perpetuate extractive, unsustainable, injustice systems within the travel and tourism industry. And speaking of indigenous resilience and wisdom, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that this event, well, the physical part of this event is taking place on traditional Mansirinate. Um, uh, tribe and to honor this, uh, you know, these indigenous peoples, the original inhabitants of this land, keeping in mind that land acknowledgement is only one of the many ways we should or, you know, we can or should do in racial equity and reparations movements. So as Jody said, like our main program is our flagship program uh, in uh, flagship certificate program in sustainability and anti-oppression in travel, which is a semester long program. And then we also have um, short courses and a new program called the Conscious Travel Series, which is a series of short courses that take travelers to different places um, around the world and look at how we travel, uh, how we can travel consciously in those places. Um, our guest instructors for those courses are all native to the countries we featured in those short courses. Um, and going back to centering the locals, right, in our uh, tourism framework, we're doing exactly that by giving them a platform to share their story, culture, current affairs, do's and don'ts, like what actions are considered respectful in their countries and what not. And uh, what are some meaningful community development projects that travelers can support, et cetera. So we launched our first destination course, uh, Conscious Travel in Guatemala in 2022. And uh, I just cannot give enough credit to our wonderful partner, Ethnica Travel, um, who is also our partner of our first experiential journey in August, 2022. And we want to thank them for their friendship, um, the thoughtfulness that they put into aligning every activity in the uh, itinerary to our mission. And the most important of all, their commitment to the indigenous communities in Guatemala by introducing us to all these mind blowingly inspiring um, indigenous led community projects. So we look forward to many more meaningful collaborations like this. So I'm gonna wrap up. <laughs> In just two years time, Rice Travel Institute has experienced tremendous growth um, support. We now have more courses and more partnerships and more donors and more followers and all thanks to the amazing uh, team of volunteers. Hi, good morning. <laughs> amazing team of volunteers who are committed to run RISE as if it was a good job. So just wanted to give a, a special shout out to my team who are here today and who cannot join us today too. Like, you know, they have been like really the most important um, fabric of this organization. So last but not least for me, um, we're an organization committed to transparency and accountability so if you're curious to learn more about our team demographics or like just any information, like including financial health, everything is reported on guidestar.org. So you can just look us up and um, learn more about us. So now I'm gonna pass, pass the mic on to Christelle and Lauren, our impact evaluation specialists at RISE. And they're going to share our highlights, you know, some of the highlights of um, the impacts that we, had in 2022 and since our inception in general. Thank you. I'm just gonna to try to stop the share so we can.
get this because people are only seeing this thing. Oh, yeah, right that's there. right. So I'm not going to stop recording. I'm sharing right now. Is it not? So people are only seeing this. Oh, okay. So I'm going to stop this share because okay. I think we're sharing the screen. Mm -hmm. Ah, beautiful. Perfect. Thank you. And it's still recording, right? It's still recording. Perfect. Thank Sorry you. about that. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Good observation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren. Um, I work, as Vincy said, on the impact evaluation team here at RISE. And Christelle and I are going to take you through some of the successes um, from 2022 working on our goals. So we have five um, organizational goals that we are working towards. Um, we'll take you through each one of these five in more detail and the work that we did um, throughout the year to achieve these. The first goal, um, inspire behavioral change that leads to sustainable travel. Um, one of the biggest ways we obviously do that is through our curriculum. So we had over 75 students enrolled across our flagship and short course programs, um, 33 of which received the certificate in sustainability and anti-oppression travel, and seven of whom you will be hearing their presentations today and they'll be getting their certificates afterwards. Um, we've also had digital badges for our various short courses. And we introduced four new courses and programs last year um, with two cohorts of the flagship program and three additional uh, programs. I think that's fine. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, thank you. Are we good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so for goal two, under creating a more equitable and sustainable world in summer of 2022, we had our first experiential journey to Guatemala with seven participants joining. And as part of this experiential journey, we were able to support 15 indigenous led tourism projects, mostly led by women, uh, four locally owned eco hotels, one local film production crew was hired, and we did award two travel scholarships for the experiential journey, uh, the equivalent of over 3.5 thousand US dollars. So our third goal is grow a community of mindful travelers. So there's a bunch of different ways that we do this, one being our social media content and community partnerships. So we've been able to grow our social following over the past year um, pretty significantly across all channels, which is great for engagement. We also have our content creation where we're writing blog posts, we're coming up with podcast episodes and um, YouTube videos. We've also got our partnerships, such as NYU, our partnership with them for being here today, Wonderful, um, Operation Groundswell, and Mezgi Tours um, for some of our events. In addition to our uh, community that we're growing um, with these partnerships and online, we also have our educational and destination partnerships, which help really bring the local uh, perspective to all of our courses and what we're doing. Um, this ties into our diversity, this ties into our community. We've grown partners all around the world over the past year. And the last pillar of the community building is our events. So getting together there in person, getting together virtually, some events which are a combination of both. We've had info sessions, um, general meetings, um, a great in-person event at Wanderfest last March, um, which was a walking tour, as well as some virtual tours in Jerusalem and our annual Giving Tuesday event. So we've brought together over 150 people throughout 2022 to talk about um, all of RISE initiatives. We also had eight industry speaking events, which was really exciting, three with Vinci, and then five conferences or speaking engagements, um, all about sustainable and impactful travel, future of travel, global social change leadership, and decolonizing travel narratives. As part of our goal around supporting diversity and equal opportunity, we formally created our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee in 2022 and infused DEI approaches into various RISE activities to center it in all of our work. So diversity, equity, and inclusion is not just embodied by things like our pricing model, which I'll talk about in a sec, uh, but also through our curriculum, through staff development, um, and all parts across our operations. So specifically, we adopted a new tiered pricing plan and new payment plan options. 35% of our paying students opted for lower tiers of pricing, 20% opted for payment plans, 15% uh, of our paying students benefited from the full-time student rate, and three tuition grants were given to students in 2022. 
Uh, this slide shows how the diversity of our volunteer staff has changed from the end of 2021 to the end of 2022. The diversity of our team is a really important part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy. Um, and will continue to be a priority moving forward. Another example of how we're supporting diversity and equal opportunity uh, is through our partnerships. As Lauren mentioned, we've been advocating for decolonizing traveler education and the range of partnerships uh, will enable instructors native to their home countries to teach us about history, culture, current affairs, projects, um, and how they want tourism to look like in their countries. So that's a big part of uh, this diversity, equity, and inclusion piece as well. And our last goal is to become a sustainable nonprofit. So obviously focusing on funding and staff development, um, we were able to raise over $20,000 in 2022 um, through a variety of different channels. Really, really impressive how, you know, various events and individuals have come together between Giving Tuesday, individual donors. Um, we've had volunteers run their own fundraisers and then um, grants that we've applied for. We've had a 35% increase in year over year number of donors. So that is really exciting to see. Um, we have built out a new fundraising strategy that's being implemented for 2023. We've also formed a new PR and sales team within RISE. So really building the foundations for another year of uh, financial growth. And we've created a robust onboarding uh, orientation program for our, our volunteers uh, to tie into that staff development uh, part of the goal. In addition to all of the impact metrics that Lauren and I are talking about, we thought it would be important to share thoughts from our students as well as our volunteers. So we will not read through all the text, but give you all uh, a minute to take a look at some of the thoughts from students about our curriculum. We also have some thoughts from our students about how the experiential journey went last summer. And then finally, thoughts from our volunteer staff. We'll be able to share all of this afterwards so you can you know, read what everyone has to say. And then lastly, some industry recognition and awards that were won in 2022. Um, we were recognized at the Bessie Awards, the Meaningful Tourism Center Awards, and the UNWTO Tourism Challenge. Um, so a lot of great industry recognition um, from 2022. So super exciting to see, and we really hope to keep this momentum going in 2023. And that is all we've got. And we will obviously share this, and we hope to have a downloadable version on the website um, shortly after, after this call. All right, cool. Thank you so much, Lauren and Christelle. Um, okay, so next up will be our keynote speech. Um, so it's, our, it's my honor to introduce Professor Christopher Gaffney here, who is our keynote speaker today. Um, so I'm going to read his bio uh, very briefly, because his bio is like, five pages long, so I'm gonna just <laughs> reduce it into like one paragraph. So Christopher Gaffney is a clinical associate professor in the Teach Center for Hospitality in the School of Professional Studies at New York, New York University. His earlier work um, focused on the intersection of urban studies and sports mega events. He served as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Latin American Geography from 2014 to 2018, guiding the journal's award-winning transformation. And by the way, he speaks fluently Portuguese and Spanish. Um, in addition to English. Currently, Gaffney um, directs the Travel and Tourism Research Collaboratory at the Teach Center, which hosts his three streams of research, global tourism risk, 
regenerative tourism design and global nomadism. He's also a director um, at Alter Earth, a nonprofit consultancy that works with uh, municipalities, hospitality enterprises, and civil society on long-term planning and integrated systems design. And the title of his keynote speech today is These Boots Are Made for Talking, a very intriguing title, Professor Gaffney. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Vinci, and thank you, Bryce, for this partnership and uh, for all of you for being here in person and on the screen. Um, this is a, I mean, the title is a little tongue in cheek, uh, but the results are not. And so I thought I would, because this is essentially about travel and being able to understand others in their own terms and having meaningful exchange, I thought I'd just talk a little bit about how my own life uh, intersected with with this the theme of rise and and hopefully will resonate with some of your projects um so i was part of this great northeastern to south southwestern migration in the united states in the late 70s and i lived in this somewhere in this jungle of things that includes didn't include whole foods at the time but golf clubs and shopping malls and a baseball stadium and it was fairly traumatic to move there and here, I, but this is one of the, this is me when I was nine, I think. And you can see it's not a really diverse crowd in Arlington, Texas in the, in the 1970s, 1980s. So this is, the, this is where I grew up with a, you know, kind of conservative culture with not a lot going on, but I did find my way through football, actually soccer at the time. Um, but then, it, it, you know, youth sports is problematic. And so even if you are passionate about something in the United States specifically, youth sports is super high carbon. And I remember, you know, the parents would have to drive us and then they'd sit in their cars when it was cold and run the motors during the games. And, you know, there's all kinds of abuse and over-programming and physical traumas. And it's youth sports in the United States is really not great, but it does allow for some kind of travel. Uh, and so people do travel a lot. I, have my, I know my younger brother has kids. He travels all over the country. Of course, it's high carbon, but he took his kid to Spain to play. So there's this kind of ability to understand the world through shared activity. And I went to England in 1986 with a team from Dallas. And I remember us playing against the Kuwaiti national team. And we were like, trying to see if we had you know hairs growing out of our lips when we were 15 and 16 and we were playing against these guys at the same age that had beards and were you know six feet tall and we lost 15 nil <laughs> <laughs> and so that was my first realization that things were at a very much different level than we were playing in suburban suburban dallas um then of course i traveled around city and state you know going to all these suburban places basically playing against people that looked like me talked like me and had similar values because um, we we're playing the same sport in the same kind of context. But then when I went to university, the first weekend I went to university playing for my university team, we went to this place called University of Texas Pan American in Edinburgh. And there it was the second realization that football is something more important because UT Pan American is on the border and everyone on that team was of Mexican descent. And they only spoke Spanish to each other on the field. And the field was lined by hundreds of people screaming at me, wanting me to lose badly in front of their kids. And it was hot and the ball was super hard and it was really difficult. And it was, it was an exposure to a different way of being and a different kind of epistemology just around sport. And, and then of course we went to Reynosa for the weekend and did the usual dumb things of going to bars and drinking too much after the game a bunch of 18 year olds in mexico so that was not a good that was not a it was not an anti-oppression tour i'd say to start with um but i was young and dumb and was hopefully going to learn something later on and i, and I did but after after university and trying to figure things out george bush got elected governor and i could see the oppression coming i said that's it i'm done sold my stuff, bought a one-way ticket to Costa Rica and hitchhiked back to the US. And this was kind of my path. And I brought my boots with me with the idea that I would be able to get on a professional team in Costa Rica because I was pretty good. 
but it wasn't amazing. But I thought, so I went and tried out for a team in Costa Rica. It didn't work. And so I just said, okay, well, I'm just going to keep traveling with my boots and see what, where it takes me. And on the left is a picture from that place in the north of Nicaragua, of Honduras called Limon, where I was playing in there in their annual Semana Santa game where everybody kind of comes back from the big city. And this was the first time that I had heard live gunshots. Mm -hmm. I'd been around people wielding guns because as we scored the winning goal, everybody took their six shooters out of their pants and started running onto the field, shooting them into the air. And I realized again, that this was something that was totally beyond my experience. But there I was playing on this team who needed you know, someone else to play. And that's me with the team on the left there. And this was a really I mean, another like, one more experience of being just immediately integrated into a community with people who I nominally had nothing in common with. We did speak a similar language by this point because I learned Spanish along my way. And it was great. And so it was a very in interesting way or a very profound way to get deeply connected into a local community. And you can see here on the left, the guy in the bottom right of that picture is wearing a shirt that I traded with him. And now I'm wearing it in the secondary picture mm -hmm. on the right where you kind of can't see it, but I'm, I'm levitating that hacky sack with my, with my brain, it looks like in the, in the ruins of Parenque, which became kind of my meditation as I was, as I was traveling is to continue to use the ball as a, as a guide. Then from that, after that trip, I ended up in Taiwan and I, in the top right, these, there are these guys that I played with the National University of Taiwan. We played twice a week and then the bottom right is my team of the gringos that I was playing with and we ended up winning the national championship there in the in the national stadium which you can see how packed it was for our, <laughs> our the, the final of the national league had exactly maybe 50 people in the stands and maybe a couple of stray cats um, but you know got some trophies in our hand on, and eventually I was able to say that I was the I was given the best player of the year award. And this is the only league in Taiwan. And so then I could forever after call myself the 1997 Taiwanese footballer of the year. Um, from there, I went back to the US um, and to Suffield Academy, where I, I, which is a private boarding school for uh, very, fairly wealthy people, but we had a relatively international crowd with people from Saudi Arabia, from, uh, from Mexico, from Brazil, from Jamaica. And again, but I was following my, following the ball around the world. Uh, and this was kind of a tremendous experience for me. At that same time, there was this book that came out called Football Against the Enemy, where it was just becoming recognized in the literature and by journalists that football was a universal connector. And this guy, Simon Cooper, who I later became friends with, had basically loaded up a typewriter in his backpack and traveled around the world to talk to famous football people. And I said, I just did that. Why can't I do that? Why can't I do it better than he can do it or differently? And so then I went to the University of Massachusetts and founded this team on the left. And this is how I paid for my master's work, was coaching a team uh, of guys who paid 300 bucks a semester to have two training sessions and, and one game on the weekend uh, for the whole year. And so that gave me tax-free cash, which I paid my, my tuition. And I was also teaching at the time and developing my, uh, my master's thesis on football uh, and the way that football is a geographic, uh, geographically relevant lens uh, to understand the world. And then after that, after I did that course in about three semesters, and I went to Argentina in January of 2002, in which was quite a moment where Argentina was melting down. It, the dollar had been pegged one to one with the peso, or the peso had been pegged to the dollar one to one for a decade, and then all of a sudden that fell apart. And Argentina went through five presidents in 15 days, and the football stadiums became sites of incredible violence. And so I had, I had gone to Argentina to start investigating football stadiums as a as critical nodes in urbanization. And eventually it got too dangerous there for me. And so I went to Rio after having watched City of God. I said, that is the place for me. 
And so I'm going to go run to Rio de Janeiro and started investigating football stadiums and football cultures there, learn Portuguese. And again, in both of these places, I was playing with, with people on the streets, uh, having conversations around football and understanding places and cultures through this medium. That eventually ended up with this book called Temples of the Earthbound Gods, uh, which was the, came out of my dissertation work at the University of Texas at Austin, where I, when I went after, after UMass, I entered with the Latin American studies crowd and we had a team called Chupacabra, uh, which is you know, the, goat, the famous goats from, from Mexico. And then after that, I went to the UNC Chapel Hill and again, got in, involved with football with a professional team and I was I became a commentator and a journalist. And then I left North Carolina and went to Brazil where I started this association called the, the Associação Nacional dos Torcedores, which was a, an organization that was intended to democratize fandom, not just to guarantee access to stadiums, but to make it accessible for women, to make it accessible for elderly, to make it accessible for families. And that process what became uh, stimulated my involvement in this thing called the Comité Popular da Copa, which was fighting against the realization of the World Cup and the Olympics in Brazil. And so having traveled the world, understanding the world through football, I became a person who understood football as also a mechanism of oppression and also a way of extracting value and ruining lives. Uh, as FIFA does, as the IOC does, as institutionalized sport does at that big level. And so my understanding of football and my, my love of the game and my way of connecting with people led me to a point where I became someone who was using my skills and my experiences and my ability to communicate with people about football to work against it. Uh, or to try to at least ameliorate the worst conditions of it. Uh, and so from Brazil, I was in Brazil for six years, and then from there I went to Switzerland. Oh, and this is a photo of, this is my, one of my attempts. This is what we were confronting. And so you can see this guy on the, on the right of the picture with the white shirt, he's pointing. He's pointing at me. And I'm trying to hand out pamphlets to these guys about the democratization of football. And so they don't want and they don't want to know anything about this. So this is the kind of thing that I was out there by myself on this particular occasion with some other people handing them out to other, you know, other areas. I had a hundred flyers in my hand trying to give it to these guys who are being guarded by you know the violent thugs of the of the Rio military police. So it was only marginally successful in changing people's ideas. And then this was a, this was the a, picture after my first game in Switzerland, where I was walking, there was a, it was a local derby game, and I was walking in this no man's land. And as soon as I got about 50 meters closer to that line of police, they started tear gassing me. Mm -hmm. But it felt so nice because I was, it was, it was like Swiss tear gas. It was so mild mm -hmm. compared to the Rio <laughs> tear gas that I've been getting for the last five years. And so it's like, almost like a perfume and I felt kind of welcomed by the, the kind embrace of the Swiss police with their relatively mild tear gas. Um, but so it was, it, was, it was not unconfrontational what I was doing in my work. Um, and so in that really in the embodiment of, of the struggle uh, for overturning oppressive systems, I felt uh, quite keenly when I was in Brazil and then less so in Switzerland because it was more of a kind of a daily perfume. So after Switzerland, I came to New York and I was hired to do the human rights assessment for the United 2026 World Cup bid. Um, and I produced a pretty robust assessment with metrics for measuring human rights, the potential for human rights violations in all the host cities. And then once they won the bid, they threw it in the trash. And so the selection process for World Cup host cities has nothing to do with human rights. It has nothing to do with anything but the profit motive, uh, which was kind of sad and disappointing. Uh, and after that, I went to Puerto Rico, where I led a team helping with the recovery of uh, the, post, uh, the Maria hurricane, uh, putting roofs on houses. And then in 2020, I started Alter 
Earth, which is a regenerative tourism model that we've been trying to uh, expand and work on in a number of different projects. And then 2021 founded the TTRC and played too much football in my life. So I, I can't do it anymore. Broken in a million different bits. But that journey has that started when I was an eight year old in, in Texas has brought me around the world and it's brought me to a way of understanding systems and a way of understanding the interaction of leisure and politics and economics and global capitalism and how we need to understand the integrated integrated systems in order to put our finger on those places where we can most effectively intervene in them. And so if you've got some boots, you will travel. Or if you more likely, if you're if you're a white man with an American passport and a few dollars in your pocket, you're definitely going to travel. Um, but if you, if you want to travel with your football boots, it gives you a quick entry into some foreign contexts and it allows this kind of immediate communication with the body, right? Your people understand you without language. People understand you through your, the movement of yourself. And this is one of the things that tourism always brings that we tend to forget is that we carry our, our, our markers with us in the body. And we always need to be conscious of that, whether it's wearing tivas and shorts into the Vatican, you know, like the typical ugly American thing, or you know, how you dress really, really matters in a, in a tourism context too. And of course, this common language that I was speaking was predominantly male. Um, I don't know a lot of women who would have done the same thing that I did, that would have had the same kinds of experiences that I had um, traveling in this way. But at the same time, I can't, I can't say I regret it or because I do have lasting friendships and a lot of solidarity created with people and enduring, really very enduring relationships with places. And in similar to tourism, we see at the global level that football is impressive. Global capitalism sucks. Uh, FIFA is a nightmare. The IOC should be abolished. We should have tactical drone strikes in parts of Zurich and Lausanne. But on the ground, when we're talking with people about these things, it's convivial. It allows us to share ideas and stories. And this is the same with travel. You know, the global travel industry is oppressive. It is the spear tip of capitalism. But on the ground, what we can do with it is creating better lives. It is allowing for uh, us to engage each other on mutually acceptable terms. And what we need to do is to be comfortable with these contradictions because we have to inhabit those spaces in between. We can't just be global. We can't just be stuck in our own minds. We have to find out where we can negotiate the interstices of these inherent contradictions that we can do something about. Uh, we can always educate ourselves more about it and we can't assume that it's gonna change overnight. Um, but every little, every trip matters, every way, every interaction does matter in the overturning of these oppressive systems. And so with that, I look forward to hearing about your experiences through RISE and applaud you for embarking on this journey. And I'm really, uh, Really honored to be uh, part of the conference. So thank you very much. Natalie, are you gonna, or Jody, or Natalie's gonna just start straight after this, right? Yeah, I can begin. That's okay with everyone. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie, and I'm um, the curriculum, a curriculum and content developer here at Rise, and I'll be guiding us through the student presentations. But first, what is the student conference? So the student conference is an annual event, the biggest event at RISE, and this event will highlight insightful research from RISE's 2022 February flagship program and the 2022 September flagship cohort to promote the incredible work our students um, have put into their capstone project. So the purpose of the capstone project is for program participants to research and investigate a problem or conflict which is present 
in the travel and tourism industry and identify the systemic causes cause or causes of the problem. Also to find um, sustainable and equitable solutions to that problem, utilizing theories and concepts from various sessions of the program. And students choose to present today at RISE um, annual student conference because it is a great opportunity to network with fellow classmates and a broad network audience of travel industry leaders while also sharing their unique travel experiences and knowledge. And just a really quick overview, the flagship capstone criteria overarches critical analysis, system, systems approach, anti-oppression lens, uh, personal reflection and recommendations. Uh, we look at the originality, um, whether the students can demonstrate their learnings from, from the flagship application of the frameworks and key concepts, the applicability of their suggestions or proposals, um, especially for tourism professionals. And our first presenter today will be Tracy Ford. So I'm just going to have uh, Jody share that screen. Am I, am I sharing my screen? Hi, sorry. <laughs> uh, Tracy, yeah, if you have your abstract um, and your bio, you can go ahead and share. Um, I have my presentation. Do you want me to sorry, share? Sorry, just my... a second. I didn't realize okay. that was my role. Hold on a second. Awesome, thank you. So for the past 25 years, Tracy Ford has traveled around the world planning events and meetings to high level government officials. During this time, she witnessed the power of personal encounters to help individuals find common ground, reminiscing on her trips. Tracy's favorite um, memories are those where she met a local and had a personal connection, um, sorry, revealing a more intimate version of the culture that could be that could only by discovering that could only be discovered through personal encounters. So Tracy's passion for travel and cultural discovery is now being leveraged to develop local insights, a platform that offers opportunities for locals and travelers to have meaningful encounters while supporting um, at need communities. Okay, hey, and Tracy, uh, you can go ahead and read your abstract if you wish. I don't want to steal your spotlight. Oh, um, <laughs> it's really small font. <laughs> I can't okay, see I can it read it. <laughs> I can't, no worries, sorry. I can read it. No worries. Okay, so the exploitation of indigenous people for tourism. Oh, if, if you leave it there, I can read it from there. Sorry. Okay. So the exploitation of indigenous people for tourism impacts local people, land, resources, economy, and cultural traditions. While tourism can benefit an indigenous population and associated economy, measured planning must be used when identifying and utilizing an indigenous location or people for tourism purposes to avoid negative impacts. Before any tourism activity is implemented, outside stakeholders should ensure deliberate collaboration with the Indigenous people and carefully examine the desired result, if any, of the local Indigenous community. Particular attention should be paid to the motivation of each stakeholder group for or against tourism, weighing potential positive and negative side effects of each activity. Each stakeholder will need to adopt a different entry posture to preserve the Indigenous cultural identity and resources. Furthermore, each stakeholder should understand each other's entry posture to provide for or mitigate the degradation of indigenous cultures. My research aims to create an impactful solution to mitigate the negative impacts of tourism on indigenous culture while simultaneously promoting the positive impacts. Before entering into indigenous communities, outsiders should shift their focus from problem solvers to solution advocates and ensure that the indigenous people are the primary drivers of any changes. By establishing success metrics for each stakeholder, the long-term benefits of tourism can be realized. Using a combination of education, monitoring, assistance, and advising, we can help create solutions to preserve Indigenous people and their cultures consistent with their values and desires. Thank you, Tracy. You can go ahead and share your screen for your presentation. 
Okay, let's see if I can. <clears throat> All right, hang on, just, can you see that okay? Or is it just taking up the whole screen? You can actually see the preview of this. Okay, there you go, it's gone. Yeah. Okay, you can, all right, good. You can't see my notes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so thank you, Vincy and Rise for this opportunity to present at this year's student travel presentation or student presentation conference. I'm really excited to be the, the launch person here and I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about what my project entails. First, this project started with my move to the Middle East two and a half years ago and launching my business, Local Insights. As I was researching how and where to launch, I saw the disparity in locations and was confused as how to properly and respectfully enter the space. So here's a picture of me. I graduated from Pepperdine last May with a master's degree in social entrepreneurship. And this is a photo of me living in Bahrain. And the upper right corner is a photo of me in Rwanda that was part of my program. Um, and I just want to say, I saw, I see Steve, my friend Steve here, who I met while I was in Rwanda has chimed in on this video call. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much. Too. <laughs> so um, I, for one, am guilty of entering um, Indigenous spaces with an ignorant posture, and I'm sure many of you have in the past also done this without realizing it. Um, it wasn't until I learned what it meant to be respectful that I participated and understood the true meaning of what it meant to be a part of a culture. So here on the left is a photo of me at a going away party in Washington, D.C. that my friends threw for me right before I moved to Hawaii. And here's a picture of me after I had moved to Hawaii several years in, and I was at a traditional laymaking ceremony for an event. Um, and I really had a much better understanding of what the authentic culture looked like and my egregious mistake that I had made several years earlier. So I realize that I'm speaking with a group of people who all likely have a similar understanding of the problem associated with tourism and indigenous peoples. But what I'd like to do is show one of the most prevalent abuses from the last century. Here are some photos from Instagram from a quick search for hashtag mercy. And as you can see, the photos look interesting and exotic, but upon closer inspection, we can see that the items illustrated are not actually authentic to the culture, but rather likely trash from tourists like keys or bottle caps. In all of these pictures, we see the sorry people, but we can't be sure that what we're seeing is authentic or just a costume put on for the benefit of the tourists to garner bigger tips. They have little to do with actual story life, but we just can't blame social media. As recently as 2021, the corporation called Tribes was a flexible workspace company, and they used the story lit plate to advertise their flexible workspaces. Not to be outdone, Black Panther used this particular image um, as part of one of their tribes in Wakanda. Um, traditionally, women in the, the story population use lit plates, not just men. So I don't know, is this maybe gender equality in, in Wakanda? In 2006, this is an advertisement in a magazine for um, a radio TV magazine, and you can see the text that was associated with it that says, at some point, one does not simply take anything, make no compromises, not at the kiosk either. So this is an ad for a kiosk. <laughs> Just seems ridiculous. I'm not sure why they needed to use this particular image to advertise. In this photo, this is the front cover of a photo book from Don McCullen, it's called In Africa. And the item that the man here is wearing is a cattle decoration. It's usually put on a sorry or mercy man's favorite cow or ox. Um, it's made of leather and iron rings and warthog's teeth, and it is never worn by the people. It looks spectacular and bizarre here. So it's likely a picture that the man wore for the photo, likely to generate or garner some tips, which is typically what has been happening in this particular area. Um, it's a decontextualized image and it's meant to create um, this sort of like enthusiasm and exoticism um, in the area. It has nothing to do with reality. 
But if we keep going back 65 years ago, this particular image with the sorry lip plate um, was used in a comic strip from Donald Duck. You can see here that it's called Ubangi and Child. Um, and you can imagine that the children of the 1940s are our senior travelers that we have today. So these are the images that they grew up with thinking this is what indigenous populations look like and how we should treat them. In 1930, Ringling Brothers used this particular image with the Surya lip plate to advertise the Ubangi savages. Um, you can see they talk about crocodiles in association with the people here. Um, and in fact, the Ubangi is not actually the name of the people, it's the Sori or the Mercy tribe. Um, Ubangi is the name of a river in Africa. So where did it all begin? begin? Uh, in 1898, this is the photo that was taken by a Russian officer in the army of an Ethiopian emperor, and it was published in 1900. So this is the first published picture of the Surya lip plate, and it's what began the exotic African continent um, and all of the information that came from there. Uh, 123 years later, we are still advertising and using this particular decoration for our own personal uses. So what's being done to preserve indigenous people in places um, at the global level, of course, the UNWTO is, has a lot of resources and information available to us. Nonprofits like RISE, thank you so much, <laughs> and CREST also have resources, education, and act as trusted agents. And uh, privately, there are tour companies and indigenous people and advocacy groups that work to ensure that tourism is beneficial. Um, but what else can be done? Um, before entering an, an indigenous space, we need to be aware of a few things. So as we approach indigenous cultures, the existing research guidelines and information um, is there. But what I think is missing is a framework that gives specific guidance on how to approach each type of culture or location, depending on how engaged that indigenous culture may be. So for example, the indigenous population in Canada has the resources of their government, local and tribal governments, there's internet access, an advanced education system, and that, that particular society is probably in a better position to manage their own tourism space, as opposed to a rural village elsewhere that has little to no internet access, they have little to no advanced education system, or a government that may not be promoting their best interests. So to create a comprehensive and personalized approach to preserving Indigenous tourism, I've created a framework that plots different cultures and areas. Obviously, work needs to be done to establish economic, education, environmental, or other cultural factors that will place each population on the chart, but this is my starting point. So who are the stakeholders? I've, I've pulled a lot of this information here from the UN WTO recommendations on sustainable development of indigenous tourism. We have the indigenous people themselves, governments, tour companies, the hospitality industry and tourists. Again, information from the UN WTO gives us some of the stakeholder responsibilities for each of these particular groups. Um, we're all familiar with this basic information. And in fact, a lot of it is also um, recognized through the RISE Institute. UNWTO does a really great job of giving the tourists some information on how to enter indigenous spaces and how to travel as a responsible traveler before the visit, during the visit, and after the visit. Um, I think all of these information slides will be available later, so if you wanted to read a bit more, you can. So now that we've identified the stakeholders and we've identified the issue, how do we avoid cultural invasion and exploitation? By combining my own research with the RISE Institute's guidelines and recommendations, I've developed what I think is a good starting point to help mitigate the effects of tourism on indigenous people and cultures. So using a list of indigenous cultures, we can plot them on a graph using two scales. The first axis is a measurement of current tourism use from very scientific term of none to a lot. <laughs> and then on the other axis, we can measure the culture's awareness of the impact of tourism or their desire for tourism from not engaged to actively engaged. Once we have the graph, we can plot individual cultures on the graph and develop some proposed solutions specific to each type of indigenous culture.
depending on where a particular culture falls within this graph, we can approach in a different way for each group. So in a culture that is not very high in tourism use, nor do they have an awareness of the impact of tourism, the approach would be something like educate and monitor. And each area would have a little bit of a different approach. So for an organization or an area that is currently used by a lot of tourists and is actively engaged in sustainable tourism, the approach is different, something like advise and assist. And there's one small group here in the bottom left corner that I think we all need to be very cognizant of. And that's the group that um, has no tourism use and they are not engaged, nor do they want any tourism. And I think as outsiders, it is our responsibility to avoid and protect those cultures as they desire. So this solution framework then, you know, comes out with a few more details here. So we have to remember that we have to approach this problem with the consent of the indigenous people. And remember that our role is to be a partner and a collaborator to co-design a solution. So using a combination of education and monitoring, like I mentioned, all the way through assisting and advising, we can help create solutions for the preservation of indigenous people and cultures that are consistent with their values and desires. Again, there's a lot of work and research to be done to identify the exact methods for each of these solutions, but I think it's a starting point. So here we are today. We have used this particular image for the last 123 years um, with actually no, no concerns or impacts whatsoever um, for, for the bottom line on how we manage these people. So what, what's gonna happen in the next 123 years? How are we going to mitigate and manage and preserve indigenous cultures? I don't pretend to know more than the UN or other worldwide organizations or even many of the people that are here today, um, but I think everyone needs to work together for preservation. But instead of a singular approach, I think the solution is in putting the indigenous people as the drivers of tourism and other stakeholders supporting the preservation of indigenous cultures, all driven by approaches that are depending on each situation and each culture. This particular photo here, I took it to the Canoe Blessing in Hawaii, and it's the reason I made that lay earlier. We had gathered together with the Kumu, and that's the holy man in the center, at the Halau, which is the clubhouse, and we were offering our thanks to the Va, which is the canoe in the middle covered in flowers, to pray for a safe racing season. And I think our approach to help preserve Indigenous cultures should look like this photo, the center of which is the Indigenous people and the others in support and not leading. I leave you with one little lighthearted comic from the far side and Gary Larson, you can see how we are um, managing here with indigenous cultures. So thank you all so much. I appreciate the opportunity to present and I look forward to any questions you may have. So thank you so much, Tracy. So if you have questions, go ahead and unmute yourself and chime in. Um, I like to give you guys a little bit of time to think of what any questions you might have. Oh, sorry, um, Anne, yes. <laughs> yes, go ahead, Anne. <laughs> Tracy, thank you so much. And Natalie, nice to see you, thank you. Um, Tracy, I really appreciated your presentation. Um, one question I had for you when you were laying out your proposed graph and looking at where you would put, you know, different cultures, how do you address the issue that in a lot of cultures, for instance, I recall when I um, co-led a group of women in Chile in 2019, and we spent a fair amount of time in the area where the Mapuche live, and we were um, visitors and um, in a Mapuche community that was very committed to having sustainable tourism options as part of its array of economic activities. On the other hand, maybe five or 10 miles away, there were other Mapuche communities that had absolutely no interest in this. So how do you, how do you, um, you can't just plot cultures on a graph and assume that every community within every culture is gonna be exactly the same. So I was just curious if you could talk a little bit more about that. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I don't think there's just one sort of all swooping, um, you know, placement of a particular culture or even a region in, in the chart. Um, I think as travelers, that approach is going to be different by using an organization or a company that's familiar with that particular area. As a tour operator, you need to understand what area you're entering and how to enter that space. And you need to be knowledgeable about where you're going. And I think being able to plot cultures on this graph is not something that I am going to do in a silo. It's something that will have to be done. Um, you know, if somebody wants to give me a fellowship to explore how to make this happen, um, I think there's going to be a lot of different markers in order to plot these groups. So whether it's an economic status or a desire for the tourism or um, an understanding of what their culture is, ha what's happening in their culture. Um, you know, are they trying to preserve it? Or are they trying to share it? Um, I think there's there's so many ways to go about doing this that a one size fits all approach is not is not going to work. Um, this was just for illustrative purposes, of course. But you know, obviously, one culture down the river from the other is going to have two different placements. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Hmm. I, yeah, sure. I, have, I have a question. Thanks, Tracy, for the presentation. Um, one of the things that I always find slightly problematic is, as, is measuring others and without allowing them to have the same kind of ability to measure in reverse. And so what would an indigenous measurement of tourists look like? Could the same kind of lens be reversed so that it's not us measuring them, but there, you know, it's, this is kind of the, when we talk about these cultures and those people, what they're, they also have feelings about the people coming to visit them. Absolutely. I, I, I should be, should be going in both directions. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I am speaking from my position of white American privilege. And so that's the approach that I am taking. Um, but I think one of the important things that I mentioned was that as the outsider, as the other, um, in whatever situation, it's not my job to go in and measure how they, the people on the inside, I don't have a better word at this point, um, how they want to be perceived. Um, we have to ask those questions. Um, do you want tourism? How can I help you get to where you want to go? How can I assist in a way that is useful and um, helpful and not bad for your environment? Um, we have to ask those questions. I, I don't have a good answer for that um, because I'm not on the inside. Um, and I'm trying very hard not to walk this line of this great white savior coming in and trying to just, you know, create this great, perfect place um, that works well for me and, and my kind of people and my kind of tourism to travel, um, but to create a space that everybody can operate in a respectful way. I don't, I don't know if I answered your question or not. <laughs> All right, that's good. Thank you. Okay, we do have a question by Sunflower, and then uh, Young, you can go next, or do you want to go now? Feel free. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Okay, so Sunflower in the chat box asked, um, "How can we be sure that indigenous operators are not exploiting their own people or culture for the profit um, of tourism?" Yeah, I think that's a definite um, issue. I can't remember exactly where it was that I was um, reading this, but there was a particular country in South America in which um, one village had done a very good job of managing and creating their own tourism space. And they were doing a good job of, of doing it internally in a way that was helpful to them. Um, and there was another village or someplace closer nearby that the government had decided, oh, hey, we wanna send tourists there, this will be profitable. Um, and the government swooped in and created this tourism space that was not useful or helpful for the local people. So when you ask me how, how I, as a 
person who's trying to launch a tour company is going to make make sure the government's doing it. I, I'm not in a position position to do that. Um, is that something that the UN WTO can do? Is that something that you know a larger governing body can do? Uh, is that something as a tourist I can do some research where I'm traveling to and find out exactly who is driving this tourism? Is this a government created initiative? What do the local people think about this? It's just about being a responsible traveler. Um, but that approach is different if you're in the hospitality industry and you're trying to build a hotel. Um, if you're coming at this as a tour operator, how are you going to approach this space? So that's part of what this project is, is to try and create entry postures for each of the different stakeholders, because those are all different depending on who you are and why you're entering that space. I can't see everybody, Natalie. So if you see other hands. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Hyung, you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Tracy, for your presentation. Um, it's really interesting. And my question is um, what, and you kind of covered this a little bit in your responses to the other questions, but what's next um, for you with this uh, research? That the, um, and like, is there like a specific region in the world that you are maybe thinking about going to to further um, some of the things you've discussed in terms of applying uh, applying that research result and stuff. So that's my question. Yeah, I, I don't have big plans to further this research, but, um, but like I said, if somebody wants to offer a fellowship somewhere, I'm happy to take, take advantage of that. Um, really, my focus right now is to, to work on my business, which is local insights and being able to create connections between travelers and tourists and something outside of the realm of big business, big government, big tourism, big hospitality, um, just to be able to make a one-on-one -on -one connection. Um, and I'll tell you, I, I just have to, again, call out my friend, Steve here, who's on the call. Um, when I was in Rwanda for three weeks, he and I had conversations every night at this guest house that I stayed at. And I really have a much better understanding of Rwanda because of these conversations that I had with Steve um, in a way that I would never have gotten anywhere else. So as travelers, I'm sure you all take time to speak with locals, but um, if you don't, please take some time to speak with locals and open yourself up to having these kinds of conversations that you wouldn't normally be able to have. Thank you so much, Tracy. Okay, so um, we have Barbara West on the chat box reaching out if anybody wants to connect. Thank you so much, Tracy. We learned so much. And if you have any other pending questions, feel free to drop them in the chat box. We'll collect them and get them to Tracy and hopefully you guys can connect moving forward. Um, we're thank, gonna move thank on. you all. Thank you, Tracy. Okay, we're gonna move on to our next um, presenter, Tiffany Rhodes. Okay, so Dr. Tiffany Rose is an associate professor at Johnson and Wales University. Dr. Rose serves as an advisor on the statewide comprehensive recreation plan committee for Rhode Island and is an academic affiliate for the Center for Responsible and Sustainable Tourism. She's also on the education and training working group of the Global Sustainable Tourism Council. Currently, Dr. Rose is working on a second doctoral degree at Clemson University. She is pursuing a PhD in parks recreation and tourism management, researching sustainable tourism development and natural resource management. Her expertise in the travel and tourism industry has led her to more than 60 different countries around the world and throughout the continental US, United States as a leader, manager, and marketer of adventure travel, ball and tourism, and ecotourism expeditions. The title of her um, capstone today is a tourism typology, the need for the responsible tourist. And in the post-pandemic context, destinations and questioning the previous allure to mass travel and are mass travel and are now seeking out more responsible tourists. As the world begins to travel again, it is imperative to convert all future tourists into develop a uh, into responsible ones to overcome past mistakes. Therefore, the purpose of this paper is to develop a typology that examines four types of tourist behavioral intentions and their understanding of the sustainable tourism principles destination managers, industry practitioners, and planners will be able to use this typology to develop marketing strategies, educational and pledge campaigns, and training programs based on behavioral theories to create a sustainable future for the tourism industry and the local communities where it takes place. All right, thank you so much for that uh, nice introduction. Um, let me share my screen.
Okay, I have multiple um, screens up. So if you could just let me know that you're looking at the correct screen and it's just my slide. Yeah. Yep, okay, perfect. All right, so I wanted to start this off with just giving a little bit of background about me. Let me move my little Zoom screen here out of the way. Um, so my name is uh, Tiffany Rose and I'm an associate professor at Johnson Wales University. And I had the great honor of being part of the fall 2022 cohort in the RISE flagship program with a few of my students, some of which are here presenting later today, um, which I'm really super excited about. Um, so a little bit about me and how I ended up um, being an associate professor in tourism, I never would have predicted that this was my course, but here I am and I'm so grateful for it actually. Um, having been completely inspired by Dr. Jane Goodall when I was young, um, I started out um, my, I guess my um, education as a wildlife biologist and I got the opportunity to study in Kenya in the in my 20s um and these are some pictures i took of the tremendous wildlife in africa that i'm sure you know many of you have seen before and have traveled there um, i had the great privilege to live in a hut right on the savannah and i loved every minute of it in fact if i spent the rest of my life living in that hut i would have been the most content i could ever imagine um, it was during that trip that I also got the chance to go to Uganda during that time and track down the mountain gorillas. And it was through this experience in wildlife biology that I realized that the only reason we still have rhinos and elephants and mountain gorillas was due to this thing I never heard of before, but it was called ecotourism at the time and still is. Um, this was a profound lesson to me that I carried with me. But along with learning about the tremendous environmental conservation problems that exist in our world and the complicated ways to solve them, I also was confronted with abject poverty for the first time during this period. Um, it's one thing, right, to see poverty on TV um, from a developed nation, but being confronted with it face to face, it actually changed my very humanity. And it was then that I decided to shift my career towards humanitarian aid and making the world a better place for people, no matter where they lived in the world. But as we learned from the RISE program and also through my own personal experience in humanitarian aid, you begin to doubt the effectiveness of volunteerism and that traditional humanitarian aid. It didn't seem to work to get people out of that poverty trap. Instead, these areas need viable, locally driven economic development. This is where I realized that maybe tourism could be an effective way to help people in this area as well. It could potentially be an amazing wealth redistributor in the world. It could give people jobs in rural communities or impoverished communities, both in the US and abroad. And it could be a powerful tool for social enterprise and entrepreneurship. And so the lesson I learned was not only can travel have this profound effect on the traveler, the tourist, through rich cultural and life-changing experiences, it can also change the lives of the locals in a positive way, but it has to be done correctly, done sustainably, and regeneratively in the way that we learned in the RISE flagship program. Um, and so these experiences and among many others led me to my current career as a professor and I teach now sustainable tourism development. I teach, we actually have an undergraduate program in hospitality and tourism, but we have this really cool master's program called Global Tourism and Sustainable Economic Development that I have the honor of teaching in. And I just found out actually yesterday that we are soon creating a specialization in our MBA program that's going to have a sustainable tourism um, specialization. So I'm pretty excited about that. So I basically start out every term telling my students that they've chosen the best field to change the world. And so it brings me great privilege to talk with you all today um, because I truly think that each one of you has an amazing opportunity to be on the front lines of making this world a better place. But all of us in the tour industry now know, right, that we need to do tourism better. And so as we learn from the RISE Travel Program, we need to rebuild tourism in a way that mitigates those costs of travel and focus on those three pillars of sustainable development that include the people, the profit, and the planet. Um, and so, you know, we were tasked with coming up with a problem um, and a solution maybe um, to, to think about, you know, addressing that problem. And so to start with a mini background that you all probably know all too well, right, is that 
Um, and as we learned in the RISE program, that tourism can have tremendous costs to the local culture, displaces the locals, has many human rights violations. Um, we also learned about animal cruelty and the negative impacts on the environment and so on and so on that creates, that tourism creates in its wake. And that leads me to the specific problem that I wanted to address today is looking at the tourist side of things, right? We also all know too well that tourists demonstrate really bad behaviors, oftentimes when they travel, not maybe not even realizing it, but oftentimes they overconsume resources, sometimes acting rude to locals, even breaking cultural heritage sites. These are pictures that I took um, of tourist names etched into the side of Tikal in Guatemala. Um, and, you know, even the whole idea of getting drunk and naked and selfies at all costs and creating trash and litter and waste and all those types of things. Um, and so, obviously, this is a huge problem that we're all trying to tackle today, right? And, um, and so, what I decided to look at is just a little mini sliver of a possible solution. And so obviously we have two sides of the coin. We have the industry um, and we need, you know, the supply side of the tourism to become more ethical, responsible, sustainable, and regenerative. And, you know, tourism management needs to change from within. And many of you in here are doing just that, um, which is really exciting. But I, I wanted to focus my project more on that demand side of things, inspired by RISE's passion, right, to transform tourists into being better. Um, so I wanted to focus on um, tourists. And so I came up with a new typology of tourists just to kind of help us think through uh, the different types of tourists and how maybe we can help them on their journey. And what I did is, I looked at maybe comparing behavioral intentions with educational understanding um, towards that responsible regenerative travel. Um, and so, let me switch sides. Um, so I decided to look at some theories to help us lead tourists to better behaviors. Um, so first, thinking about that understanding piece of my typology, the education piece, do they actually understand um, what it means to act responsibly while um, going on their vacation. And I looked at the elaboration likelihood model. Um, this is a model of persuasion. It's a general dual process theory of attitude change. And this model discusses two basic routes of persuasion. And one route is based on compelling arguments central to the issue. And the other is based on the effective association and inferences tied to peripheral cues in the persuasion context. So um, in a study uh, done by Guadam in uh, 2020, he argued that all, the amount of knowledge about the environmental problems would subsequently impact a tourist adoption of sustainable principles based on the ELM. Therefore, he concluded that environmental knowledge positively impacted environmental action. Um, this model can be employed to build better communication and persuasion strategies to educate tourism on sustainable principles and could be applied to those cultural dimensions and economic dimensions as well. And now, um, you know, thinking no single perspective can offer a definite theory on consumer decisions and behavioral intentions. Um, any expectation that such a model exists uh, that explains every type of tourist behavior in all situation and context is actually unrealistic. However, this is maybe the ultimate challenge um, when converting all tourists to responsible ones. And one of the, the probably the most maybe overused uh, at this point, but a very valuable theory is the theory of planned behavior. Um, and this is a theory for understanding the complexities of, of human behavior and has been broadly used in tourism to evaluate and predict sustainable behavioral intentions of tourists. Some studies use this to predict reduction of tourist waste or intention to stay in green hotels or engagement in my favorite bicycle tourism. Um, this originated from the theory of reason action um, and Asian indicated that actual behavior is positively affected by behavioral intentions. Um, and these intentions are positively affected by attitudes, subjective norms and perceived behavior control. And so here's a little uh, look at that. Attitudes, right, refers to the positive or negative feelings and evaluations performing a specific behavior. 
Subjective norms refer to the perceived social expectations and pressures to behave in a particular way. And finally, the perceived behavioral control um, is one that is, can we actually feel like we can accomplish that specific behavior? Is it in our control to actually act in a particular way? This leads to our behavioral intentions. And so the Taurus typology that I developed is I put behavioral intentions on the Y axis and the understanding of responsible travel on the X axis. And I came up with four basic types of Taurus. And the first one I wanna look at, right, is responsible tourist. So who is this? And the responsible tourist, if you look on the graph, right, it has a high, this is the person who has a high level of understanding and has high level behavioral intentions to practice responsible travel based on sustainable tourism principles. And so they apply all these great lessons that RISE um, taught us in the program. How to travel in a way that doesn't oppress others, but creates a space for beautiful and empowering cultural exchanges while also supporting viable local economies while mitigating those negative environmental impacts. This is the type of tourist that has high value and should be the model for all other tourists. Um, the thing that I thought was interesting is even the responsible tourist has constraints in acting responsibly on their trips. Um, and the three biggest constraints that I found in the literature was included in convenience, pricing and availability. Um, so if you think about that, this is something that the industry as a whole needs to address on our side of things, making sure that sustainable options are available and um, convenient and are affordable. So that's our model, right? Trying to convert everyone into being responsible tourists. So let's start with the next one with the teachable tourist. Um, the teachable tourist is one that has high behavioral intentions for responsible travel, but they aren't very, they don't have a lot of understanding of what that actually means. And I know that for me, I was in this place for a long time. My heart was in the right place. Um, and, you know, thinking I was traveling well, but I was actually wasn't. I needed the Rise Travel Institute back in the 90s. Um, I needed to hear more from Tracy in her presentation that she just gave on Indigenous people um, and travel. And how many of us in here today could probably say the same thing, right? And I apologize if you can hear my dog snoring. It's not audience members, but I have two bulldogs and both of them are snoring so loud right now. I, I must bore them to death, right? <laughs> so sorry if you, that's disturbing you. Um, but so thinking about this teachable Taurus, right? We wanna convert them in the responsible one. Um, so thinking back to that elaboration likelihood model, this, um, you know, thinking that they have a shallow understanding of responsible uh, tourism. Um, so it's along with this pro program like RISE that managers in tourism should expand their provision of environmental education programs to increase tourist understanding of sustainable tourism. Um, they include environmental, cultural and economic impacts. So RISE Travel Institute is playing a key role in this part of my typology, and they couldn't be prouder of their initiative, passion, and dedication in making travel a better place. The third one on my typology is what I deem the pleasure-seeking Taurus. And this type of Taurus displays a really high understanding of sustainable tourism principles, but interestingly, they choose not to act on this knowledge while traveling. Instead, this type of tourist indicates low behavioral intentions towards responsible travel. This is the traveler that maybe acts highly sustainable and responsible at home, but hey, we're on vacation. That kind of mentality, right? You know that saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas kind of thinking. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, we all probably been here at some point in our travels. Um, we opt, opt for that clean towel every day and so forth. I know that I, I have been guilty of being the pleasure-seeking tourist myself. Anyway, since this group of traveler already have a high level of understanding on how to act responsibly, education programs will not work exclusively, right, to convert this type of tourist. Knowledge does not always lead to action is what I found in the literature. Instead, this type of tourist behavioral intention must be shifted to become a high value responsible tourist. Um, and so thinking with research says that, you know, responsible tourist self-identity was a primary predictor 
of subjective norms that Taurus with a high level responsible Taurus self-identity displayed more obligation towards those norms um, while traveling. An application of this finding would be for practitioners to develop marketing segmentation strategy that targets this market niche while also creating a social expectation and atmosphere of sustainability that pressures the pleasure-seeking tourists to adopt responsible behaviors, marketing campaign, campaigns, destination responsible commitment strategies, using travel influencers could all be practical tools in increasing responsible intentions and behaviors in this um, particular type of tourist. Thirdly, it was found in the literature that perceived behavioral control, that feeling that I could actually do it while traveling was the main predictor of behavioral intentions leading to action. Therefore, the our you know, us, we must improve access, sustainable infrastructure, transportation methods while reducing barriers that constrain responsible behavior. Mitigating the cost of acting responsibly is an essential step in creating a more sustainable future. Um, and so improving that access. And so lastly, um, who is the unaware tourist? Um, as you can imagine, they're the ones that don't have any understanding of responsible travel. And maybe because of that or separate from that, they also have low behavioral intentions for responsible from your panel, um, travel. This workshop number four. Alexa, stop. <laughs> um, we could probably consider that this includes most mass tourists. Um, so to convert this type of Taurus into a sustainable high value one requires both that education training piece um, and also that shift in behavioral intentions towards um, responsible travel. And so this one needs a multifaceted combined strategy to help um, lead you know, this type of Taurus um, into a responsible one. And so mitigating the cost of acting responsibly is an essential step in creating a more sustainable future. Um, and so in conclusion, as the world faces severe environmental, cultural, and economic problems, a shift towards responsible tourism behavior and awareness is critical. It has been well studied that tourism contributes significant adverse impacts on a local region, sociocultural, economic, environmental systems. So, but stopping travel altogether is not feasible since that would only hurt destinations economically and, and potentially socially. Um, other ways of reducing the negative impacts therefore needed. Therefore, a sustainable tourism model such as a responsible travel is becoming increasingly recognized to promote the demand for sustainable industry while simultaneously increasing the positive impacts of tourism on the local destinations around the world. And Rise Travel Institute is playing a key role in doing just that. And so that's the end of my presentation. You feel free to ask me any questions um, and you know, take down my email address. And if any of you want to pop into any of my classes and help usher my students along in their journeys, um, we would love to have you. Thank you, Tiffany. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and open the platform for anyone to share any questions. Amanda to say that she wanted that this typology is so useful for her, her travel podcast listens, listeners fall into all these groups and you've given her ideas for ways to engage the pleasure-seeking and unaware tourists. Great stuff. Thank you. Can I go up? Question. Hi, Tiffany. This is Chris. Yeah. Um, thank you. That was really super interesting and valuable to understand those, those frameworks. I have a couple of questions. One, it seems like going from an unaware tourist to a responsible tourist needs a lot of steps. So why wouldn't we take them into the teachable before taking them to responsible. And then the second part of that is that at what point do people stop being themselves and become tourists? And so are unaware tourists also unaware citizens? Are responsible people responsible citizens in the places that they live? And how do we then, and I guess the third part of this is how do we educate people to be responsible humans uh, and not just responsible tourists. Yeah, I mean, the the most, all the literature was talking about, right? We want, 
you know, all the researchers that right now are studying um, the motivations on how to, to act sustainably in our own lives and to apply that to every, everywhere that we travel, right, is, is really big right now in research, trying to figure out what it will take, you know, to motivate us, um, you know, in, um, in acting responsibly. And what was interesting in it, one thing is that acting responsibly at home was found in the literature that doesn't ne necessitate acting responsibly when traveling. Um, so that was interesting. And so that's why I kind of developed that pleasure seeking idea of, of, tour of tourists to think about in our strategies is that sometimes we act really sustainable maybe in our own lives. You know, we turn, we are like, if you think it just environmentally, we, we turn off the lights in our room and we don't crank the heat and, you know, even just basic little things like that. But when we're on, um, or we don't maybe generate a bunch of food waste at home, but when we travel, sometimes we throw all of those responsible behaviors out the window. And so there wasn't this transfer um, from behavior at home to behaviors um, while abroad or traveling um, necessarily, you know? And so there does have to be sort of an interesting, you know, look at specifically tourist behavior in that model, um, because sometimes it doesn't translate completely, right, to, to our behaviors um, in traveling. You know, it's like you think of, you know, you know, us in hotel rooms, even, you know, cranking the heat ridiculously high and leaving it on when we go out all day or the air conditioning all day. Um, those types of things, like people wouldn't do necessarily at home, you know, but we do at um, work. And what was interesting, one study that I read, um, I can't remember the person's name um, off the top of my head, I apologize, but they talked about even just like food waste and in realizing that, uh, you know, people were just in, even at like those breakfast buffets, like in hotels, it just tr produces so much tremendous food waste. And there was little things that they could do to change their behavioral intentions, even to the point of like changing plate sizes and having signages. Um, and also, you know, the other article that I thought was interesting was having signages in rooms that said that other people who stayed in this specific room acted this way and that that actually perpetuated more responsible behavior um, because it goes into that social norm and the theory of planned behavior where if it's you feel like it's a social expectation and everyone else is doing it we're more inclined to also do it um, but this is so layered isn't it I mean and I would agree with you um, it, with taking that unaware tourist and maybe trying to get them into that uh, teachable tourist first um, you know, can it happen that they directly go straight to responsible if we were, you know, do work, work on their, it, it, it's potential. I mean, that would be an interesting research, um, you know, a research conversation, I think, um, as far as how can you get this unaware tourist to act more sustainably? Can you apply both things simultaneously, change their behavioral intentions and educate them? Um, you know, when you think about like the Palau Pledge which I'm sure you all are pretty familiar with um, and how effective that has been, right? As a little like educational tool and also um, persuasive behavior, you know, to change behavioral intentions. Um, you know, I don't know. I think human behavior as we all know is very complicated and very nuanced and very layered. Um, and there's, there's probably no quick fixes here, right? It's gonna take a multifaceted approach um, and dedication to all, you know, people in our industry. So, thank you. I don't know. I don't know if that answered your question, but no, there you have it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Okay, we have time for one quick question. And did you want to? Yeah, go ahead. That's okay, Tiffany. Um, thank you very much. I again really appreciated this presentation. Um, I I love that you focused on the tourist or the traveler, but I also am feeling like in this whole issue that there's a huge need for the travel industry, destinations, tour operators um, to play a role in this. And there are ways that I think 
they can make more sustainable choices, the default options. Perhaps that's what you were alluding to when you said smaller plates and the kind of signage. Um, you can also be working with um, operators where uh, they just are already aware that um, making sure that they're maximizing opportunity for locally produced, locally sourced food, um, providing for picnics or whatever it is they might be organizing in terms of meals. It only comes with recycled packaging, et cetera. So I think that there is definitely a role to play for the tourists, but people go on vacation and it's not that they have bad values all the time. It's just that they're in that vacation mode. And so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, not just on the educating the tourists, but also making sure that the industry and the respective parties in the industry are also doing their parts. Yes, absolutely. Right. It's like thinking about that supply side versus the demand side. Um, you know, you, it's, it's interesting because if we change the demand demand side, right, and people start demanding it, maybe that will pressure, right, the supply side of the business to modify, to change, to rise above, to, to you know, to, to live up to those expectations. But on the other side, right, the supply side of things, if we, if we just became a, a more sustainable business, all, all inclusive, the whole thing, you know, and it hasn't been, right, it's been, it's been, you know, founded in, in very unsustainable business practices um, for 50 years, you know, so to change that, and, and I have hope, right, you see, like, tourist companies changing and becoming better, um, so, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's, it's definitely, I'm excited that, you know, there's a lot of talk now around this on the supply side of things as well, so, but I think I need to let others go on and I appreciate you giving me this opportunity. Um, thank you, Dr. Vincy Ho, um, for all the great work that you're doing. Thank you so much. I actually thank have you. a question for you, but I, I will ask that like, you know. All right, thank you, <laughs> have a great one. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much, Tiffany. We, we do need to move forward with our next, but if, of course, if you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat box. And Tiffany can, we can, you know, jot them down and get them to her as soon as possible. So our next presenter here is um, uh, Jabuli Nguenga. So she has run into difficulties with her internet access uh, where she is traveling right now and isn't able to join us. However, she is a travel writer, sustainable and anti-oppression advocate and founder of Travel Africa with Jabu, uh, which is a travel coaching business that helps travelers who have suffered profound loss find and give connection, compassion and conversation through community-led travel initiatives in Africa. So after experiencing tremendous personal loss, she realized how connection with people can open a broken heart for this, to the spirit of abundance. She's traveled to 18 countries on the continent and several more abroad, now uses her personal experiences and industry research to help people have more transformative and sustainable travel experiences. Jabulil is also is a published author, travel writer, creative content creator whose work has been published in Lonely Planet and Time Magazine. And her title is called Invisible Bodies. So if you look at the photographic images of indigenous people today and from decades earlier, the African body, women, men, and children is void of little more than ideas of barbarism and primitiveness. Photography can tell powerful stories, but African bodies are often bound to general captions such as women from Kimbo tribe, or teenage boy in the Omo Valley, or Maasai men dancing, which speaks little to the intersectionality of their identities. Names and giving names are in intrinsic rituals for any family. In Africa, the naming ritual gives identity, honoring the child, the ancestors, the spirit world, um, the nuclear family, and extended family, and the environment. So photographic images cannot tell a true story if they do not give identity to the people whose images are captured. And she focuses briefly on the history of what is known as tribal photography. She looks at the problematic issues that come with it and how it does not promote sustainability in travel. And the end goal is to launch the hashtag Say My Name campaign, 
through social media and future travel related work, encouraging conversations between photographers, indigenous people, and re uh, readers and travelers. So now we're going to move on to Mira Shah. So Mira Shah has a background in social impact fueled by curiosity for the world and an adventurous spirit. She spent the previous four years traveling independently and extensively, both living and spending short stints in different parts of the world. Her experiences abroad have shaped the way she travels. Mira is dedicated to contributing to local economies and preserving nature, habitats, and biodiversity through her travels. She's in the process of specializing in sustainable tourism, focusing on wildlife tourism and animal conservation. Her title is Wildlife Tourism in East Africa, a critical analysis of the approach to safari tourism. Her abstract, she, uh, I will be critiquing safari tourism in Kenya because this is a topic that I have most experience in having visited multiple safaris in Kenya. I will be using Maasai Mara as a key example to critique modern day safari tourism because it is the most visited and widely known national park in Kenya. Maasai Mara represents what can result from increasing popularity coupled with poor tourism control and restrictions. I will also be using my personal experience in Amboseli National Park to validate some of my findings. My goal for writing this paper is to shift consumer consciousness in the safari tourism market, ultimately persuading organizations to hold themselves to higher sustainability standards and governments to establish regulations and policies that will encourage more sustainable and ethical safari experiences for tourists, local communities, animals, and the ecosystems involved. I will be referencing both academic research papers and my own personal anecdotes to present this information. Welcome, Mira. Hi, can you hear me well before I start? Yeah. Okay, great. Got some headphones. Go ahead and share your screen. Amazing. Yes. Going to share. Can everyone see the right screen? Because I also have two screens. So, amazing. Um, so, my intro sort of spoke for itself, but um, I will be talking today about the ethics and sustainability of safari tourism in Kenya. Um, I've lived in Kenya for the last four months, and I just um, have had a growing passion and interest in this specific industry. Um, and also feel very passionate because I've had lots of, you know, personal experiences. Um, so I took the Rise Flagship course uh, in this last fall. Um, so the capstone's quite fresh to me. So I'm still working on substantiating more of this research over time. So the way I am kind of structuring my presentation today is I'm focusing first on the history of safari tourism and its roots in colonialism. I think it's really important to touch on this because a lot of um, what happened at that time manifests today. Um, so I really want to definitely hone in on this topic before going into the impacts, which is the next thing I'd be talking about, um, just the negative practices that occur in the industry and their impacts from my actual personal lens, as well as some of the academic research I've gathered um, over the last few months. Then um, perhaps the most important, um, the solutions. So how we, you know, as travelers can positively shape the direction of the industry, really applying the traveler lens, because the focus is on here is shifting consumer consciousness. Um, and then more so just how I have been applying some of the research and findings beyond this program and beyond this capstone um, in my time in Kenya while I'm here. Uh, brief uh, history. So the earliest safaris recorded were in the 18th century, primarily focusing on slave trade. Um, then in the early 20th century, with the establishment of colonialism, safaris evolved from being solely about business uh, to exploration and actual big game hunting. Um, then there was uh, over time in around, uh, I think, 1939, these national parks, a lot of them um, specifically in Kenya, kind of uh, were reserved solely for conservation. And that, were, that stemmed from this, in, this movement from conservationists to push for um, better you know, ways to conserve biodiversity in these spaces. Um, so basically what happened during this time is the British uh, developed a game committee um, with only you know, British aristocrats and other government officials. They displaced local communities um, and essentially did not allow lo local communities to enter the parks, even though that was their you know, territory and kind of where the land they used to sustain themselves and instead kind of marketed these places um, as for safari tourism. And now to this day, safari tourism is marketed you know, as a means to participate in sustaining the African economy 
supporting wildlife and supposedly also supporting local communities. So if there's one thing I really learned from RISE and kind of just honed is like that, you know, all these impacts, um, the impact we're having on the environment, the impact we're having on the ecosystem, all of this is like all under the umbrella of sustainability. And we can't just focus on one or the other in terms of like, understanding how to be a better, more sustainably minded traveler. We really have to understand the integrated system and also understand how the impacting local communities actually impacts the environment and the ecosystem. And it's all kind of under one umbrella of sustainability. So the practices in the industry that I have seen, um, so first of all, just everything related to vehicles. Um, so offer driving, close animal vehicle encounters, um, crowding, chasing, noise, um, also, something else is just generally just tourist overflow in these national parks just due to, you know, partly it's, it's a to it's, partly it's due to increased accessibility, partly increased accessibility results from more tourists wanting to visit these locations. And then something that I think we don't talk about in this industry enough, and especially in animal tourism, right, is also just the impact on local communities. So kind of this uh, the, it, the perpetuation of a colonialist system here where like still to this present day, there's still little local involvement in decision-making and profit sharing. Um, so first, um, just overcrowding. So kind of what happens well, despite restrictions and regulations, right? And so, tons of these national parks, I mean, vehicles still continue, you know, to drive off road. Um, some national parks enforce these more intensely, whereas certain like Amboseli, whereas like the, this last week when I went to Samburu, I went on a safari and the driver was primarily only driving off road um, the whole time. Um, and then there's also this culture, this camaraderie amongst, you know, guides, right, where like each driver alerts each other using their walkie talkies. It's like a beautiful experience to see that they're not trying to just like, you know, keep their own business that they want others, other guides to also, you know, attract or tourists and have an, like have animal encounters. But what happens with that alert system is that there's a lot of crowding that happens and, you know, people driving too close um, to animals. And so there are regular, like, there is, um, you know, best practice and certain parks have regulations saying no more than five viewings or five animals at a time. And also like no going no closer than 20 meters, but that's at least on the experiences I've had on safaris that's not practiced. Um, so what, how does this affect the animals? Well, I mean, we all know it's just a significant disturbance. They're physically uncomfortable. Um, it also, one thing that I really have seen a lot of is it's affecting their migratory path and routine. I mean, most of the time, everyone wants to see the big hunt and that happens. And when you are focusing on trying to catch an animal hunting its prey and there's a bunch of cars surrounding it, um, you, I, I've seen several instances where we've intercepted that, which is clearly a negative impact on that animal um, getting its sustenance, but also just has like uh, greater, you know, ecosystem impacts. And then there's also physical damage to vegetation um, and conflict with local people. Um, kind of when you are again off road driving, taking animals off, you know, again the territory that they use to sustain themselves, and then they have to find other areas to kind of access to to be away or removed from vehicles. So lots of times, animals also have been seen to you know destroy local crop and land um, and so why it happens I mean again focus everything here is really driven by tourist demand so safari drivers you know they want to do everything in their interest to tailor their offering to tourists and honestly like um, the the tourists themselves what I've seen and heard is like most people really want to see you know like an animal um, up close. They also will have a checklist of animals that they wanna see and access while they're on. And so there's a lot of pressure they place. And then, like I said, limited regulation and enforcement. Then going into just um, the um, tourist overflow. So with, with more marketing of safari experiences, with the marketing of one seeing natural animal in its natural habitat, there's naturally an increase also in tourist lodging and facilities. So it's not just a vehicle kind of, um, you know, crowding that, Takes, that happens. There's also um, 
you know, improved roads and airstrip development as well. And that definitely affects the carrying capacity, which increases pressure on the area. It's also harmful to the animals who um, tend to feed on tourist trash um, displaced from that land area. Um, and I distinctly remember an instance last week where I was actually staying at a, at a lodge and I saw um, and a uh, rare hyena show up and I was like, oh wow, this is amazing seeing an animal in its natural habitat just to find three, like five minutes later, um, one of the lodge facility, like one of the workers there actually was like fed the animal. And then the next night I saw the animal come back. So clearly that's not at all like a normal um, natural <laughs> way of viewing animals. It seems like animals are coerced there and it's not really necessarily the lodge's lodge as well, they'd want to attract more customers. So there is that um, dynamic. Again, why it happens, again, driven by tourist demand. Most tourists, including me, want to stay inside the national parks. And again, no restrictions on the number of visitor entry or facility development. And then finally, just like a general perpetuation um, of, you know, colonialist system here, like locals were never, you know, involved in land management. Um, so at, when, you know, the, um, you know, British, the game committee developed these like areas for conservation. Um, there was no, there were locals were not really involved in any decision making there. Um, and kind of the negative impacts of not involving the locals um, manifest even today. It's poor, it's just a poor and unsustainable way to manage land, resulting in environmental and biodiversity loss. And uh, I've read a lot of research that the actual decline in animal populations hasn't really, um, the rate of decline hasn't really changed over time. Um, despite these boundary setting for conservation. So it leads us to question whether conservation is even like happening. And I think not involving locals or having them at the forefront of decision making is just not really leading to the sustainable outcomes. Um, and then it's a perpetuation of the poverty cycle. So uh, basically what I've also seen is um, I've read about local communities receiving little profit from the land, but also in instances where you know they are kind of staffed um, to work in these lodges. I don't really have clarity or visibility into how much they're actually paid or whether that's even a socially or economically empowering experience or something they sort of feel obligated to be a part of because it's the only way they can really earn money around that national park territory. And then they're also, um, uh, there's every time I've gone on a safari, I've always been asked, like, do you want to go to a local community and, and village and, and have them dance for you? And I, those, those activities I've seen are not the most necessarily socially empowering for locals. And I don't know if they're really contributing to those communities, considering um, they haven't really been uplifted from those poverty cycles, um, despite this happening over a number of years. Um, again, everything comes back to driven the drive from tourist demand, you know, the need for tourists to have cultural experiences. Um, and like I said, it's a perpetuation of a colonialist legacy. So, um, sorry for the wordy slide. Um, I'm not reading the food, I promise. But I want to talk really quickly just about best practices that I'm applying that we as travelers can kind of apply um, when we decide to engage in a safari experience. experience. Some of these are more simple, some of these are more difficult. Um, opt to you know, travel during off season, driving to the national park instead of flying, you know, staying in an accommodation. That's a hard one outside the park because sometimes these accommodations are so far from the actual park that it, you're spending all your time traveling. So it's not necessarily the most uh, like easy solution and when possible minimize, uh, but do it whenever you're possible and it kind of, it will minimize, you know, the negative impact, but also something I've done and I focused on as my time in Kenya is like reaching out to a local, you know, I've, I have a friend here that I've made that works in human rights and conservation um, to get a set. And I'm, I've basically gotten a sense from her which tour operators and accommodation are more sustainability focused and continuing to educate family and friends about that. For accommodation, staying in a conservancy or a private reserve is better than staying in a lodge or a hotel. A conservancy is basically land owned by, um, you know, a local community and either rented out um, by, a, a, a basically rented out to support safari tourism, um, or they they actually own the land to support that. Um, and then directly asking, you know, safari operator questions on how they operate sustainability, setting expectations, giving feedback. I've been working really closely with the uh, tour operator I've been going on experiences with, and I've shared a lot of feedback with her that she's been so receptive to because she's also very socially, um, uh, social, socially like impact driven. 
Um, and then when asked if you want to visit a local village, politely decline, but ask if there is an alternative. Generally, just understand the embedded colonial context of a safari experience and actively challenge that information um, you receive to counter unconscious biases and not being hot on ourselves because our negative experiences shape our growth. How much I, I haven't checked the chat. Do I have? Oh, great. Um, just a quick, quick one on just applicability beyond rise, because I think this is the most important. So that safari operator is telling you, I'm currently kind of working with her to develop some educational content, whether that's developing a pamphlet to put in vehicles to tr educate travelers or blog posts. Um, recommending sustainable operators to friends, um, you know, hoping to explore the option of staying in a conservancy. And I won't go through all of these, but the key one that I really wanna, you know, focus on is the fact that I'm seeking to further substantiate my research and personal experience in safari tourism, add more details to the findings that I've even developed during this capstone project in a way that I can maybe potentially publish this and spread the word to gain more credibility. And then just continuing to evolve in my understanding of sustainability and systems approach. I'm wanting to take a lot more courses on this subject. And yeah, um, just this is just a starting, like a stepping stone to sort of where I want to end up. Thank you so much, Maria. So I'm going to go ahead and open it up for any questions. Lily did comment, as someone who loves safaris, I really appreciate this and all the practice advice you provided. Comments? Yeah, I've got a hi. It's Chris. A uh, quick question about how the measurement of economies and and the kind of larger impacts of the tourism industrial complex on the communities around these parks how is it possible to get robust data in a short time and are you know so we always hear about how beneficial these are and and i know there's all kinds of conflicts with poaching and setting parks aside that are traditional lands of Maasai or, or other groups, how is it that you can get good information from communities to involve, incorporate into your assessment? And are there government agencies or other kinds of organizations that are doing this work that you can collaborate with in your assessment? Great question. Not sure if I can totally give you a full answer as of yet, as I'm, I'm still continuing to do research more so on the economic impacts on local communities. Um, to your point about uh, like involving them, from what I know, I've heard conservancies are local owned land um, that essentially you can kind of rent out, but there is a lot of, you know, exploitation. Uh, that happens there. So it's not necessarily that because you're staying in a conservancy, it's the most ethical option. But I've heard that that is one of the ways at least to minimize the impact on local communities and contribute. Um, however, we have to think about how expensive that experience is as well. It's not um, economic, like it's, it's very expensive to stay outside of the national park. So I don't think that that is the most sustainable solution to engage and contribute to local economies. Um, but yeah, collaboration, I have seen like as well in my experiences, um, a lot of, you know, Maasai women sort of selling these little, you know, bracelets outside of the national parks. But it kind of like while it's a, I don't know if it's the most, while it might be for some, you know, something that feels really culturally authentic and good for them, it might not be the most economically viable if like a ton of them are doing that as well. So, um, and then there is an element of desperation there that we've seen. So I, I've been talking to Phoebe, who is somewhere on this call, hopefully she is um, the tour operator I'm sort of working with 
to kind of understand better ways to work with local communities to economically empower them. But I, I don't really have the research right now for all the questions you have, but that's stuff that I'm also thinking about. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a big question. And of course, every park is different and different national park systems are different. And so Kenya, Tanzania have different models. Uh, Botswana, Uganda, also different models. So I just would I just encourage you to find out what the how those things are actually measured and and also a second thing is to look at the demographics of who's paying for these trips. Is it only foreign nationals or are there also domestic tourists? Are there and are there is there an ability to increase intra-African tourism to parks? So it's not just perpetuating this kind of white colonialism, it could be white wealthy, so it could be wealthy African colonialism instead. And so it doesn't make it better, but at least it changes the dynamic. I mean, there's definitely a way, like they're trying because the resident uh, rate at the national park is actually quite significantly lower than the rate um, it is for, for like a foreigner to go into a national park. Um, I don't think it's particularly the most effective. I would say the majority of, Again, this isn't backed by, uh, it is backed by a little bit of research I did, but also what I see. Um, it's majority like Western dominant um, travelers coming to these national parks. So um, I think that's a really great point you bring up around just figuring out or understanding it's not necessarily what is kind of the drawback of, you know, or how, how do you attract more um, locals to, you know, attend or engage in these experiences. Um, right, if, it is, if it is a national patrimony of Kenya, then it should be mostly for Kenyans and not for New Yorkers. <laughs> you're right, you're right. Yeah, definitely. I want to kind of look into more of the statistics on, on who's actually um, going on these experiences. I, from what my anecdotal evidence and also what I've seen is it's, it's not that. But Kenya is a wealthy country, so there should be plenty of people that could, you know, if they get wealthy relative to. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course. No, I wonder. Yeah. People in Nairobi that could. Schools and, and such could be brought out to the parks. Yeah, I think it's kind of also that case of, and I don't know if it's necessarily a wealth thing, but also just generally um, like, even when I live in a particular part of the world, like, like if in the States, like I rarely travel within the States, I'm always kind of traveling outside. And I think a lot of my local friends, actually, I've talked to them and they're like, oh, like you're doing this. Okay. If it's all planned out, like I want to join you, but it isn't really kind of top of mind as like something they, they kind of just see it as this is in my backyard. Like, I don't, I can do this anytime. I don't need to do this now. Like, so there is an element of that um, as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry, I think there's, yeah. There's some Thank questions. Oh. Yes, we just have uh, one question here from Mary Pat. Have you noticed any interferences in animal activity by safari operators? Um, meaning not the guides, right? You're you're talking more like the operators who who hire the guides. Am I correct? Oh no, I do mean the guides actually, like on the safari itself. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely, and I think that's a system. Again, it's not really like. I would never blame the guides for, for doing that, but definitely when I've been, every safari, I mean, the last safari I was on, the guide literally was so close to animals trying to get the perfect shot for me. Like we were chasing it even, and I think it was happening so quickly. And this is the first experience I had where it was that intense that I didn't have a moment to give the, the, the feedback that like, and in a, in a, in a nice, cause they're just doing kind of what they know. I mean, most people want that. Most people are like, hey, like I need to see a leopard. Like I need, I, like find me a leopard, right? And so it's like very like, they're like quick to do. And I mean, there's an element of like the economic benefits. You might get a bigger tip and that's what tourists generally tend to do. They get bigger tips when they actually are able to see animals. But um, I did give feedback to Phoebe who's on this call um, about that experience just from like a systems, um, like just like this is what I've seen and maybe next trip I go on with you, I really wanna set the expectation that I'm not the typical tourist to, to shift the consciousness there so that the guides also kind of understand that not everyone 
um, is like that. And I have seen, like I told you in the presentation, interference also from these lodge operators in like feeding the animals, which I don't know if this is common practice, but that was what I saw last week. And I thought that was honestly a little crazy, um, but yeah, so. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna move it over to Jody now. Thank you so much to all of our presenters who've gone so far. Um, it's been a really inspiring and really interesting morning. We're um, gonna take a break now so everyone can stretch their legs, get some lunch, um, and then we're gonna meet back here at one o'clock sharp for our next presentation. Uh, yeah, Rachel, Eastern time. sorry, yes, Eastern time. Not everyone is there. So um, in a little less than an hour um, at 1 p.m. Eastern time, Rachel's gonna start her presentation. So I look forward to seeing you all back here very shortly.